I'd like to thank Bill and uh, Donna and Mike for inviting me to uh, be program chair. I've really uh, uh, developed a love for developing educational content over the last uh, 10 years, uh, mostly through the Arthroscopy Association of North America, uh, of which I was the president uh, two years ago. So uh, since we are at Holy Cross and uh, we're mindful of our Jesuit tradition, I think that we should, uh, we should start with a prayer. And I'd ask Father Keith to... Uh, to uh, say a prayer to bless our gathering. So as we begin, we want our hearts to be in the right space and place. So let's do so by turning with gratitude to our God. Gracious God, our deep desire is to give glory to you, which we know is not about your ego, but about serving the flourishing of your people. So may we be mindful of this day of your many blessings, be grateful for them, but also know you call us to steward those gifts in service to others and especially to our students, amen. Thank you, Father. Um, so uh, we have a really, I think, remarkable program uh, today and it, that highlights, I think, the unbelievable talent that is harnessed uh, here at Holy Cross in regards to medicine. I mean, I, I really can't believe that there hasn't been an organization like this before, and I'm so happy uh, to be involved in it now at its inception. So um, uh, we're going to have uh, four speakers. I'd like them to be about 20 minutes. We'll take five minutes of uh, 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 questions after each. Uh, try to stay on time so we can get to the tailgate because uh, we're going to go beat the pants off the crimson after this. Um, first, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Marcus Stoddard. Uh, Marcus is a cum laude graduate of the college from 1978. He went on to medical school at John Hopkins, not Georgetown, and then a residency in cardiology and a fellowship at St. Louis University. Uh, he's been part of the faculty of the University of St. Louis since 1988 and is currently a professor of medicine in the department. He's been the clinical chief of cardiology. Uh, he's currently the chief veteran fair medical society of Louisville, as well as the cardiology fellowship director. So a real educator. He's authored 30 book chapters and over 100 peer reviewed articles. And he's going to speak to us today on the role of echocardiography in stroke. Thank you so much for such an enthusiastic uh, applause. I appreciate it. When I, when I came in, actually, uh, this microphone was this high. Now, I didn't know Bill was going to come and speak first, so I, I lowered it for my level. So that's why it's too low for you. Well, thank you very much for, for, for this opportunity to be here. And that's my, my uh, mouse is clicking away. Can you go back to the first slide? Yes. All right. So my topic that I chose related to what I one of my passions, and that is uh, echocardiography and transesophageal echocardiography in particular, because of it's, it's a multifaceted technique. And one of the major impacts, I think, is in our patients who come up with strokes, particularly ischemic stroke. We have a um, stroke center, and they just work us to death. But it's good. I've learned so much now, and I think I'm getting a great deal more insights as to the various different things that this technique called transesophageal echo helps us in our stroke population. And I wanted to share some of my thoughts about it. Let me see if I get my mouse up to work. Let's see, it's over here. Went left one time, went right. Is this uh, still in there? This people? Okay. Uh, yes. You can come up here and help. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. I'll say no, it won't. I'll, I'll have some slides that will oh, hang gotcha. up if I do that. Gotcha. Yes. I can advance the second chair. Yeah. Okay. Let's try it. Let's try you advancing, and we'll get to the slides that won't advance, and then we'll have a discussion. <laughs> okay. Let's, okay. So, uh, no disclosures. Okay. So, ischemic stroke is really what transesophageal echo has as a very important impacted in terms of diagnostic techniques. And if you look at the kind of things that you can have that causes ischemic stroke that TE could offer a, a diagnostic tool for is cardiac sources, aortic sources. So we know that. Also cryptogenic stroke, where after an exhaustive workup, really nothing is found. And one of the things that we of course now know is that PFO closure may be actual helpful in this group of patients. In fact, PFO closure is we thought, well, when we did the initial studies, they were not good, didn't show any good outcomes. Now we've rethought that process, and now it is an advantage. So detecting PFOs by TEE and ECHO in general. And then that big group of atrial fib patients, about 25% of these ischemic strokes 
are associated with atrial fib. And that's sort of a no brainer, but you think, well, you're going to anticoagulate and why do you need an echo? Why do you need a TE? Hopefully today I can show you there's a broader thing you need to look at in that population of patients too. And also it can help guide procedures like closures of devices. Go ahead, next slide. All right, so uh, these, these are the ischemic strokes. 87% of all strokes are ischemic in nature. Cardiac or aortic sources, about 20%. Cryptogenic, a big population, 30%. So we have to figure out what's going on in this cryptogenic group that these patients are having strokes and recurrent strokes that we're missing. And TE may offer some insights into that. And hopefully I'll be able to share that with you if my slides will advance properly. Then there's a big 50% group or so at the bottom here, small vessel occlusions, cervical cranial arthritis, atherosclerosis, which are not related to cardioembolic, and that's not going to be a role for echo, particularly in those cases. Go ahead, next. Is that one else? That's you, huh? Are we fighting one another? <laughs> okay, so look, this is my world, right? We talked about stroke, and this is just a small list of the things on TEE and echo in general that you can find as causes of stroke. So I wanted to emphasize it's not just left the, the left atrium, it's not just the left ventricle, it's not just clots, it's all these things, and particularly on inpatients, we see all types of things, catheter clots, pacebreaker clots, fibroelastomas, lambo excrescences, atrial septal aneurysms, mobile strands, mitral calcium, all these things, and this is uh, made to order for diagnostic purposes by TEE. So I just list those, and my point is that you need, next slide, a comprehensive technique to look at all these things. And that's why TE, I think I'm so enthusiastic about. And the yellow that I highlighted here is some things that people may not be as equally aware of are associated with strokes. One is this, this dysfunctional left atrial appendage, even if there's not a clot there. Uh, stasis in the SVC, superior vena cava, or the IVC. Intrapulmonary shunting occurs in all of us, believe it or not, it's a normal finding. It, it occurs, but it can lead to paradoxical embolus and also pulmonic vein thrombosis. These are the things that hide. This is why patients with cryptogenic stroke, if they have this area of stasis, you don't look at the technique, you'll never find pulmonic vein clots as a culprit for that patient's stroke. Next. So this is a study we did years ago, and this is even predating some of the diagnostic things I thought would be helpful uh, in this, these populations, but we put a cohort of 200 patients who had hemorrhagic stroke or TIA. And it was a typical population, middle age, predominantly hypertensive, diabetic patients, hypercholesterolemia, and tobacco use. Now, I remember 80% had tobacco use. I remember when we presented this study or submitted it, they said, this can't be right. It must have been error. 80% of your people smoke? I said, this is Louisville, Kentucky. <laughs> yes, 80% of the people smoke. That was an accurate finding. So after we beat that back as a, as a, as a criticism, this must have been always an error. So obviously smoking is doing something. It's causing inflammation, it's probably leading to thrombosis, probably leading to strokes too, but that's a harder nut to crack. And AFib was a smaller population. Thanks. So this is why I broke down. At least one or more T findings were present in 58% of this group as a potential culprit for stroke. Thrombus, stasis, myxoma, PFO, things that potentially could impact care. And the treatment was changed in 29% of these patients. Anticoagulations were started or stopped, obviously for clots or no clots, antiplatelet drugs, antibiotics stopped or started, and cardiac surgery in the myxoma patient. So, and for the diagnostic tests, which is for restraint in terms of healthcare costs, were either promoted or canceled when it was needed. So 14.5%, once you found a, a conclusive diagnosis, these other tests that were considered were no longer needed. So it had an impact there. So the point is that TE impacted the care of these patients in over 29%. And none of these patients who had vegetations were not originally thought to have endocarditis, and that's what they had. So they had earlier treatment started in that group. Next. This is another uh, study too that was published in 2016. 88 patients, this is tryptogenic stroke, the tougher nut to crack. In that group, TE also found causes for stroke in 69%. So a good number of patients. The impact though is only 9% of the patients where they were change in care. And if you look at the study, you'll see why, but in the cryptogenic group, that is a, a tougher group to, to sort out as to what you think is the ultimate diagnosis. But 9% at least had a change in care without an anticoagulation started or cardiac surgery promoted for say tumors that were found. Next. Okay, so click on. Are you, are you playing, did you bring it up off of their drive? 
Uh, yes, it's on the track. Did you you brought it up from there? Yep. Okay. I, best laid plans. I worked on this uh, for about uh, fifteen minutes to get them to play. Uh, you click, click on, why don't you right click on it? Do you have a mouse that goes right there to click on? Yep. It? it clicks on the image. Yep. Let me do this. Uh, can I slip in this USB port with your guys' patience? Or yeah. let's try to. <laughs> No, don't take that out because I want to control it. Okay, good. Yeah. Why don't you take this one off? I'll just drive off the USB. The clips don't play as smoothly, but they do play. So that's that's the whole goal. I have these problems all the time. Just tell us what the band is. <laughs> let's, try, let's try to get this to play because I told Mike, he said, you have 30 slides, so you're going to get that done. I said, Mike, they're all moving clips, and they'll take five seconds to clip, 10 seconds to clip, and it won't go over. I apologize. And Mike. <laughs> but, Be careful, but Mike, he's the general. general. He's the general, that's right. I don't know why my, it's not, there's my mouse there. Let's see if I can get it onto this tree. Okay, I do have it onto the tree. All right. So we just have to. Um, let me let me see if I can I toggle through to get to the USB port myself. Yep. If you go down. Go down a little lower left. Uh huh. But it, it's you know it's awkward, and uh, you where do we go here? It's down. So you have a. Um, uh, you yeah, pick the file. Yeah. Pick the, yeah, yeah. The, no, no, no. the file. Uh, yep. At the bottom. Uh, uh, right here. Oh, oh, okay. That is that's where it's saved to. That's where the drives are. That's where the drives oh, okay. Are. What drive is on? Do you see USB? I have my eyesight is poor. I don't see the USB on there, do you? Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, if you want to do it from this. Well, okay. Why don't you open it from there, and I'll see if I can drive from that point out. Is it from the? I like my. I'm, you know, I don't drive, but when I'm if, if there's another driver, I let them drive. I'm not good at driving, so <laughs> I'll let you take over. They didn't have computers at Old Cross for this great. We had computers, but they were like ones we played Star Trek on. Yeah. <laughs> <It was like laughs> Is that from the USB drive? Uh, yes. Okay. Let, let me just click through here. Let's yeah, see you might be able to click if you click through on the lower. Uh, here you go. Right. All right. All right. We'll see if it runs, though. That's the next step. All right, go. Oh, it's a place. Oh, all right. So this is a huge thrombus in the left atrial appendage, ready to make its way out for a cardiac embolism. So these are sort of things on transesophageal echo we see commonly. And um, it may make an impact. If you ever had a patient high risk with bleeding, has bed score this high, and you had something like this, you were reluctant to anticoagulate, well, you should not be any longer. This is a 15% or more chance for stroke per year. This is a 3D rendering of the left atrial appendage, and you can see the two clots here that are highly mobile. Another high risk for stroke in a, in a separate patient. Okay, now this is different. This is a left atrial appendage, it's dysfunctional, and all this swirling around is stasis, spontaneous echo contrast. The risk of stroke in this patient is almost comparable to the patients with the clots. So just, and you're not gonna find this on any other imaging technique. It's gonna to have to be TEE to find this. So this made an impact. This is a patient should be anticoagulated unless there's absolute contraindications to anticoagulation. So this occurs in sinus rhythm as well as atrial fib. So it's not just atrial fib, it occurs in sinus rhythm as well. It involves the left atrial cavity. This is a 3D, so in all the spaces of blood flow in the left atrium, all this brown swirling, this is prethrombus formation. This is a predisposition for clot. 13, 14% year chance of stroke chronically, even. Uh, so it's going to require long term management with anticoagulation. These sort of imaging techniques do impact our recommendations. This is uh, from the ASA AHA 2014. And these are now, these are clots in the aortic arch that are mobile. All the other is atherosclerotic plaque. Obviously, the plaque we know is associated with strokes, but associated with strokes often because they form clots on it. And these sort of patients, in addition, uh, to antiplatelet therapy and stat statin therapy are candidates for anticoagulation. You can diagnose thrombus, mobile thrombus in particular. 
And the, the risk of this is higher than left atrial appendage clot leading to stroke. This is probably 20% or higher. So this is a super high risk for subsequent embolic events. 3D echo, this is of a transthoracic study. This is a large thrombus at the apex. Again, another patient where LB clot is obviously going to be something that needs to be dealt with. So imaging then will make an impact in that sort of patient. Look at this finding. This is a PFO. This is the right atrium, left atrium. You have this big blast of contrast occurring going from left to right, I mean from right to left. And these are the sort of patients that we're doing percutaneous closures of. Here's why the problem occurs. You have a thrombus that traverses the PFO, goes from the right atrium into the left atrium, leads to paradoxical embolization. You can see that this came from a leg vein. You can see the linear nature of this clot. It came from a leg vein. So this is a patient who would be, obviously needs some corrective action for that in you know, long term. So PFO closures have, have been a big thing now. They're, I don't know at your institutions whether they're caught on. They were put to the wayside early on because the original larger trials did not show benefit from closing these PFOs. But when they extended one, of those, one or two of those trials out and did additional trials for long-term follow-up, we now know that closing these PFOs, particularly in the right patient setting, is important. You don't have another explanation. There's no interpulmonary shunting. There's no uh, other explanation for the clots. These are the, uh, for the stroke, these are the sort of things that are now supported. So this is patients who have PFO, closures by percutaneous techniques, cryptogenic stroke population. So that's the hard one to treat or to find the answer to. Closure one, PC, respect one, close and reduce. And this is the subsequent years that they were published. So all now these five trials, um, when they put them together, now support it. Early on, the respect trial, about a six year follow up, 3.6% versus 5.8%, a hazard ratio of 0.55 in terms of reduction of stroke by PFO closure was seen, statistically significant. And the closed trial after five years, again, similar findings, there was like a hazard ratio of 0.03 and you flip that, I always have problems with these ratios. If you divide this number into one, that's the relative risk of reduction. So one divided by 0 0.3 or this would be like one divided by 0.55, so two times less risk. You know, almost infinitesimal greater less risk. And again, for the reduced trial, 3.2 year follow up again showed similar findings with PFO closure in this cryptogenic population. This is when you did a, a meta analysis of all the trials, and we found that what well, was found that 2% rate versus 4.5% PFO closure versus no PFO closure in this cryptogenic group. So, meta analysis also supported it when you combine all of the studies. And this is what PFOs are like. So here's the right atrium, left atrium. This is the foramen valley membrane. And these bubbles are traversing a really a slit-like opening from the right to the left atrium. And what we now, we think that patients who have more market PFOs, 25 bubbles or more, they're the higher risk group. And these are the type of patients that they're also larger PFOs that probably benefit the most, not just any PFO. We know 25% normally people have PFOs. But if you look at the ones who have stroke and the ones that we think are related to PFOs, their PFOs tend to be larger, they tend to shunt more. And also it couples with sleep apnea. If you ever see patients who are doing TEs, as soon as they obstruct, all this shunting occurs, it enhances it. So that's maybe the coupling mechanism between sleep apnea and stroke. These patients who open up PFOs and have strokes related to it, paradoxical envelope. All right, this is a splattering of a lot of things on one slide. This is an amplastic closure, what it looks like. You actually have a closure device on one side of the septum, the other umbrella type closure on the other, and they squeeze these together to close off that channel. This is a 3D rendering of it, what it looks like. And just because I just think it's pretty neat looking at it from on, on top of it, looking down, this is one of the closure portions of it. And this is the recommendations as to what to do with patients with PFO, whether they need to be closed or not. That was in 2014. I don't know if it's been updated yet, but I think it needs an update. And the recommendations were if you have recurrent DVTs, you do PFO closure if you have a PFO. In other words, they wanted the ammunition of a DVT. And that was 2014. So the earlier trials didn't support just closing it up front. 
Now with the 2017 trials, we're now closing these. We're not looking for DVTs in particular because they're hard to find anyway. They're gonna be effervescent. They're gonna come and go and you may miss it. So now they're being closed. So this guideline will subsequently, I'm sure, be updated. You'll be seeing, if you're not already, your patient's undergoing PFO closures. Yeah, this was one of my hang-up slides. I have to prepare for it. Now look at this. This is a patient who does not have a PFO. It's an intrapulmonary shunt. So if you look at the original bubbles that come across, I lost my mouse, but that's okay. Look at the bubbles that come across. They enter the right atrium, and then they gush into the left atrium up here. But they're coming from this vein. You can see the bubbles right there. That's intrapulmonary shunting. It's not an ABM. It's not cirrhosis. These are physiological channels that open. They can open with exercise and different type of O2 settings. They open up in all of us, which is, which is kind of interesting why we would have them to begin with. But it's a portal potentially for paradoxical emboli where clots that formed in the right heart or veins could have made their way through a PFO. So that's a, not PFO, but intrapulmonary shunt. So that's why I always think it's critical that if you're gonna close a PFO, you need to make sure this is not present either because that, that portal is still there and you're not treating it. That patient may still require long-term anticoagulation because that's an existing route for strokes to occur. And so this works is, with sleep apnea patients as well? It does. It happens with sleep apnea patients as well. And it's kind of shocking actually that it, that it occurs. And um, look at the frequency of it. This is, a, this is the breakdown of the study we looked at for all strokes and TAs versus controls. If you cut to the chase, PFOs are 23% versus 17%. Not quite statistically significant, but look at this intrapulmonary shunt. 22% who had the strokes versus 10% without. Whether these patients are predisposed long-term, no long-term follow-up studies, but it was you know, twice as often. So it was definitely an association when we looked at the intrapulmonary shunting. If you looked at the cryptogenic group, the same thing held up, 35% versus 7%. So even a broader difference. So this is something that's untapped as to maybe these patients are predisposed for paradoxical immobilization, the ones that have significant intrapulmonary shunts that is technically physiologic. And the odds were six times more likely to have um, in, in the stroke group, this phenomenon, intrapulmonary shunting versus not. So I think that's intriguing. Okay, outside the left atrium, outside the box, this is the inferior vena cava. These are bubbles, saline contrast bubbles. You see these little brown dots. They hang around forever in some patients. This is areas of stasis. The inferior vena cava is an area of stasis. The superior vena cava likewise is an area of stasis. And when I say stasis, naturally, it's not something that, that's abnormal. Blood flow just hangs around it. And it then would predispose to thrombus formation, throw an inflammation. Then you have a, a mechanism by which these particular patients with this physiologic process could be more predisposed to form clots, throw in a PFO in the same patient. Then you have the chance for paradoxical embolism. And you're not going to find it. You're going to do your cryptogenic diagnosis at the end because you're not going to find anything if you look at a conventional way of looking at it. Take a look at this one to the right. Go back, back, forward. Okay. This is actual clots forming. These little string thrombi forming in the inferior vena cava because of the stasis. It's not a dilated IVC. It's not really a, a stagnant site in general, but you can form clots in the IVC. This is the superior vena cava. One is running for us, and it shows basically thrombus coming out of the superior vena cava into the right atrium. Also another place for thrombus to form and stasis to occur. And this is one I found very interesting over the many years I've been doing these techniques is that every now and then you run into a patient who actually has clots in the pulmonic veins. And that's what's being shown here. This is a 3D. If you look down into this vein, you see these little brown things whipping around. Those are actual clots forming in the pulmonic veins. So you're not going to see this with other techniques. This is a patient who had an embolism and it doesn't have a PFO, doesn't have other things to suggest a reason for stroke would need potentially long-term anticoagulation unless you have an explanation for why this would be transient and go away. I don't know of an explanation. That patient is now predisposed to have subsequent strokes. All right, let's, let's move on to another topic. And that'll be my ending topic, atrial fibrillation, because that comes up a lot. You have AFib, you've had a stroke, anticoagulate. What's the big deal? Well, that's true. In the majority of your patients, that's true. But you know, patients come in all kinds of flavors. Some are high risk for bleeding complications. You think of other techniques like a watchman closure. Other patients are, you know, you think you're low risk, zero CHAD VAS score or one. But on TE, you'll find findings like spontaneous echo contrast that will increase their risk considerably over just a clinical assessment. So in those patients, it may make an impact. 
So let's just see about this technique. I thought it'd be interesting to share with you then. All right, so here's the Watchman device. It's on a steerable guide that this little umbrella shape is put in the left atrial appendage. This is the left atrial appendage from above on the 3D. This is with it being deployed. If you look up here, you'll see the Watchman going advanced being opening up. It is now in the left atrial appendage in a very secure spot. And this is when a 3D, you're looking at the Watchman umbrella type device with this guide catheter. And this is after it's released, this little stem is there. You look for, make sure it's not painting around the device that's gonna occlude off the left atrial appendage. So just, I thought that'd be interesting to take a look at. That's how it's put up and very successful technique. And in fact, if you look at this meta-analysis of the studies that have looked at it, there's been a reduction in, in um, hemorrhagic stroke. Overall stroke was the same as anticoagulation. And this is the meta-analysis that was released in 2015 by Holmes. So ischemic stroke uh, was not significantly different. Hemorrhagic stroke was less with the Watchman device and combined stroke rate was about the same. And I don't know why death was less in the Watchman group. Not sure why that came out. So here's the indications now for these closure devices, moderate to high risk for stroke, CAD vest three or greater, with a relative contraindication to long-term anticoagulation, perhaps a high HASBLAT score, usually a three or more. And randomized trials are proved as efficacious. These devices are safe and equivalent for total stroke and superior for hemorrhagic stroke. And for some reason, cardiovascular mortality is less. I don't have the explanation. So if you have a hemorrhagic, a patient who is high risk for for bleeding, say 4% per year or greater. You know the patients, the older GI hemorrhage, previously fall risk patients. Then this finding is gonna push you to move on to anticoagulation or watchman because this patient is at incredible risk. This is actually, I showed you this before, 19 times more likely to have a stroke than a same type of patient without it. Mobile clots, five times more likely to have a stroke. And that's every year. Spontaneous echo contrast, 14% chance of stroke per year, whether it's in the left atrial appendage or the left atrium itself, versus 3%, and this is in a AFib population. So this is my two concluding slides. Uh, in terms of do patients with AFib, for example, require cardiac imaging? I think practically all at least need transthoracic. T in most of these patients, um, highest, you can define the highest risk group for left atrial appendage thrombus or left atrial thrombus. Hemorrhagic conversion patients, you delay anticoagulation, but some of those patients are candidates, they have a moderate or lesser size stroke, but many times we delay their anticoagulation, but if you find high risk for subsequent stroke in the Aristotle, not Aristotle, but the, um, the um, I'm forgetting the name, the trial, they, they randomized patients and found that patients starting earlier, if you can find high risk, do better. Transthoracic echo is used for as a tool. T can be a comprehensive set. So it's not just the left atrium, it's all those other things we talked about briefly. And so this is my clinical assessment. Hit CT, all these things are done. Transthoracic is done in most patients. And T is first, as a first technique, it is a reasonable technique to start with first. And, you know, patients who have no high risk for T complications, and you're looking for all these different things in a comprehensive manner. And then this is this, the white elephant in the room, does it impact overall improvement in, in outcome? No studies have shown outcome differences other than the trials that are looked at PFO closure, you know, T can show a PFO, you close it, you do better. Uh, clots, obviously anticoagulated or not, you do better. So in that sense, there is that kind of data, but not just seeing if T in itself results in better outcome. And I always put this slide up because I read into it about 15 years ago, love it, and here it comes again. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much for your attention. And sorry. I went over. Yes. No question. Um, you know, with the recall of the Philips CPAP machines, it's like 3 million people, yeah. particularly your, your emphasis on the risk of stroke with, um, with, with CPAP, uh, with a uh, sleep apnea. I mean, if you had patients calling you and say, what should I do? Should I wear the CPAP machine? Because you know they can't get the replacement. So, what do you think the risk of coming off CPAP is? I, I think there's a, a bigger long-term risk, heart failure, those sort of things. The immediate stroke risk, I think, is relatively small because most of those patients, in and of themselves, are not predisposed for stroke. But if they have had prior strokes, that's the group I would focus on getting back on their CPAP because I think that patient, particularly if a mechanism was never discerned, and cryptogenic, it may be one of these PFOs that are playing a role. And 
obviously closing it, you know, and every patient is not going to be feasible. So I, yeah, I, I would select it for those who had previous stroke TIAs. And then I think I would certainly try to get them back from this. Yeah. Your morbidly obese patients with the uh, with sleep apnea, by the way, which in West Virginia, we have a lot of those. Yeah, we do it normal. Um, well. <laughs> the TTEs are not as diagnostic as the TE. So do you normally just recommend a TE when you have those um, patients? I stay out of it, <laughs> but they recommend it for us. They come for TEs almost always first. Right. And, I, we, and so this is many years ago. I said, well, what is the safety of TE in these morbidly obese patients? So we looked at it and found that it was equally as safe, obviously done with, understanding of the, of the respiratory risk, right? right? So, but equally as safe. So we do them. I feel very comfortable doing it. We, we don't have anesthesiologists to support most of our TEs. So having with that background, I, I feel very confident doing those patients. And it's, it's the same field. Are, they don't really have diagnostic T, TTEs no. because of body habitus oh, issues, okay. right? I won't say it's a waste of time, but it's a comparable to that for looking for stroke causes. For other things, you want to look at the LV function, so forth. You're going to get a good idea of that. You have contrast agents to help. But if you're going to look to see if there's a left atrial appendage clot or left atrial stasis or, or something PFL. like that. Or PFO. Or even a PFO. Absolutely right. Yes? You know, as you know, I'm an old guy, so. Uh, do you, I don't know. Do, you, do the kids today, do they still ask about platypnea and check for orthodeoxia? And do you know of any correlation between those analyses clinically and PFOs and in, uh, in, uh, echoes? We still teach it, and we see patients occasionally, not very frequently with that diagnosis. Yeah, I still taught. And so it, it, it definitely is a real entity and um so pfo weighs right in there with that so in fact yeah we're still teaching i think it's so important to know about so unexplained you know cyanosis or something of that nature so it's still a board question it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's yeah, it is. yeah no i've absolutely. had some students come back and say like whoa i'm so glad you told me about that because i got that <laughs> yeah, answer right absolutely but i also um it's impossible in our institution to get a te before they always get a tte first it's philosophy you know it depends on your echo director and that their philosophy is not to have that done before for reasons that occurred in 1974 <laughs> when T first started. Maybe we can bring them up to 2021. No, because I don't think that there should be no litmus test that you need a transfer acid for a T for the right indications for TEE. I don't think, you know, obviously sometimes the T is just going to be too high risk. Let's just see what we find on a transfer acid. The COVID era has made a big impact. We do start mostly with transthoracics and the COVID patients, but they go on to have TEs as well um, because there's a risk to the staff, right, from, from COVID itself. So outside of that, we do do TEs up front and many of these indications. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Marcus. That was great. Uh, now on from the uh, squishy organs to the uh, more uh, solid ones. Uh, so I, I was, I'm a sports medicine doc by training, uh, but I became very interested in the practice management side of things and healthcare delivery uh, as I moved through my practice and uh, studied the orthopedic workforce, ways to deploy it, and how we could deliver healthcare uh, at a lower price point in a more efficient manner. And I'm currently working with an organization that uh, is doing that, and uh, some of the data that uh, I'm going to uh, report today is from that. Um, Again, next slide. So I couldn't go without uh, showing this. This is uh, the 1980 Holy Cross rugby team. Uh, we weren't big, but we were slow. <laughs> and somehow we still managed to uh, win the New England Championship 1980. Now, most of us uh, stayed out of jail uh, fairly long, but uh, uh, not so uh, uh, well for others. And why is uh, this uh, slide germane? Well, because uh, some of these guys have actually already had their knees replaced because of traumatic uh, uh, post-traumatic osteoarthritis. So, uh, you know, uh, next slide. Um, you know, uh, Douglas MacArthur called uh, war the malignant scourge. Well, certainly osteoarthritis is a malignant scourge. And unfortunately, uh, m many of us in the, in the room are learning about it as we age as the baby boomers go through. And so there's uh, 27 million people right now. Now I've heard as high as 48, all in, all, all in. There's 27 million just with knee osteoarthritis, 48 million with osteoarthritis per se. And that's going to double in the next 15 years. And it's a huge uh, direct and indirect cost. I've, I've heard quotes as high as $500 billion, right? So an amazing cost. 
There's about a million total knee replacements done in the United States a year now, and about 400,000 total hip replacements. And that's going to quadruple in the next 15 years. So the, the, the disease burden and economic burden that this represents is significant. Right now, Medicare's number one line item is total knee replacement. So think about that for a second, right? Of all, you know, uh, there's what, a uh, hundred million um, Medicare recipients, I think it is. I mean, the largest line item is uh, total hip replacement. So um, as, uh, as the need uh, for total hip replacement goes up and the cost associated with it goes up, we're gonna have to find ways to deliver that care uh, at a lower price point uh, with better outcomes. Next slide. So, you know, osteoarthritis, incurable, right? Chronic, um, limited treatment options, right? Not any one treatment works. Uh, and, uh, and some are limited in their efficacy, right? Certainly total knee replacement works, but about 20% of total knee replacements, uh, patients have some type of continued symptoms, right? Uh, so it's not a perfect operation for sure. And sometimes the evidence that we use to support what we do is, is lacking or, com, or conflicts. Next slide. Um, you know, what we'd like to do is have some type of disease modification, but there really isn't, next slide, there really is no disease modification right now, but we're just treating symptoms. Now there is, there are some things on the horizon. There's a medication called Lorsivivant by, uh, made by a company called Biosplint uh, that, um, that may have disease, some disease modification aspects to it, but for all intents and purposes, all we're treating here are symptoms. And you know, basically, uh, pain, lack of function, et cetera. And you know, we have uh, pharmacological ways of doing that. We have injections that we can use, either uh, steroids, PRP, uh, uh, long-acting steroids, or uh, even the hyaluronic acid. Uh, but uh, all in all, the endpoint is total knee replacement. Next slide. Next slide. So what about cell-based therapies, right? Stem cells. This is the latest buzzword, right? There's really no such thing as stem cells, right? These these progenitor cells that are marketed as stem cells uh, really only have a paracrine effect. In other words, they only have a, a, a pharmacological effect. They don't really live uh, in the joints and produce new cartilage or uh, things like that. So we like to call it cell-based therapy instead of uh, stem cells. And there are there is a lot of hope here and a lot of promise, but we certainly haven't harnessed that. And uh, you know, a lot of uh, people are taking advantage of this with some marketing and uh, the FDA, FDA is currently going after them. This is suspected to grow. It's about 10, I've heard as high as $25 billion market per year, and it, it's growing between 15 and 25% per year. So this is, you know, this is going to be part of our armamentarium too going forward. Next. And you know, another big issue is opioids, right? A lot of people are treated uh, with, with chronic osteoarthritis with opioids. And you know, this is a real big problem. Uh, so we have to find ways of managing this disease without resorting to opioid medications. Next slide. And the, the, you know, we get back to the, the problem of, of evidence. So this is just uh, hyaluronic acid, right? So uh, sodium hyaluronate or visco supplementation is, you know, uh, hyaluronic acid is in your joints, right? It's a viscous polysaccharide that uh, lubricates and sort of cushions the joints. And there's over a hundred randomized clinical trials documenting the safety and efficacy of sodium hyaluronate, but there's still discordant recommendations based upon those randomized clinical trials. So even our highest level of evidence, uh, you know, uh, the meta-analysis of uh, randomized clinical trials come to different conclusions concerning the treatment options, which is a real dilemma for us as we try to have an evidence-based approach to the way that we take care of patients. Next slide. Uh, and then you get to cost. Right, so we're spending what is it two trillion three almost three trillion dollars a year in healthcare now, and this is going to go up as we uh, um, uh, age, and you know certainly uh, with total knee replacement being the largest line item uh, to Medicare, the government and payers are significantly uh, worried about these kind of costs going forward. Next slide. So what do we need to do? Well, we need to we need to assume more control of the episode of care, and then deliver more value inside of that episode. Now, how do we do that? Well, we do that by assuming all the risk inside of the episode, pricing that, and then delivering that care in the lowest uh, cost site of service. Next slide. 
And what can we save? And this is just a savings to Medicare, a migration from the hospital setting to the ASC setting uh, for, uh, for surgeries that have been routinely done in the hospital. It's about $5.7 billion a year. And this is going to go up. So um, this is a uh, the cost savings are about 45 percent just for the facility fee alone when you migrate from the hospital to the ASC setting. Next slide. So what do we do in orthopedics valued care? I think the most applicable thing for orthopedics inside of these value based uh, phen phenomenon is a bundled uh, payment arrangement where the whole episode of care is priced. It's like next slide. When you buy a car, you don't buy the pieces, right? So you go to the orthopedic surgeon, he's gonna say like, you need, you need a total knee replacement. And he works in this little silo and just delivers that care. Well, you want the whole, next slide, you want the whole car. So when you go to the orthopedic surgeon now, what you're gonna want is you're gonna want treatment for your osteoarthritis and you're gonna want that total knee replacement to be bundled in to a package with a price on it. Next slide. So what do you do is you define that episode of care, things like orthopedics uh, which are very amenable to this because we have start point and end points of care. We have predictable costs inside of that episode, and we can actually price that. Next, you price it, all inclusive. Next, you mitigate risk, right? There are a certain amount of complications associated with this. So you have to price that into your bundle. Next, and you have to control your costs, especially in the post-operative uh, period. Most of the costs associated with uh, total joint replacements actually occur in the 90 days post-procedure. It's about, eight, almost it can be at 80% of the cost. Next slide. And then you meet to most importantly, measure your outcomes, right? We're pretty good at measuring our uh, economic outcomes because it's dollars and cents. We've been much poor in uh, out documenting our clinical outcomes. And now this is essential as we move forward with, uh, with this type of value-based care. Next slide. So what do you need here? This, is, this just doesn't happen. This tremendous effort to put these programs together it requires a significant infrastructure with a lot of people that monitor these patients, right? So you need scale. You can't just do it on a small basis. You need to control and own all the means of production inside of that episode, including the facilities, uh, any post-op uh, care centers, uh, uh, physical therapy outlets, et cetera. And then you need to analyze your, uh, uh, your outcomes. Uh, and you need to have a quality improvement program so that you're continually working on uh, improving your quality. Next. This is the trends to watch, right? We're going from 1.3 million total joints to 3.5. There's about 5,000, uh, a little over 5,000 hospitals and surgery centers in the United States of America. Only about 500 of the surgery centers right now are doing outpatient total joints. This is going to, this is going to explode in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, last year, ACUS, uh, the American Hip and Knee Society, did a, a survey of its membership, and only 31% of their members who do primarily joint replacements were doing outpatient procedures. So this is going to, this is going to be an area of tremendous growth and paradigm change for the practice of orthopedic medicine in the next 15 years. Next. And this is sort of what can be accomplished. This is uh, from the Barron Brothers. Most of this is going on in the Southeast and the Midwest right now. Very little of it up here in the north, uh, Northeast uh, and, uh, and on the West Coast. Uh, this is 19,000 uh, outpatient total knee and hip replacements. Average age is 50. So these are, this is a selected population. They're younger and their comorbidities are less. Uh, next slide. And you can see 97% of them were discharged the same day. Very low complication rates. So low complication rates inside of these type of programs are usually about 3.5 to 5.5%. The uh, complication rate for inpatient total joint replacement is eight to 11%, right? So better, uh, less complications, right? Next slide. And this is uh, um, the data from our practice. Uh, one of our practices in Jackson, Mississippi. They started an outpatient total joint program five years ago. So far we've done about, uh, this is the first four, almost 4,000 that we did. We do about 2,000 a year now, so it's a big program. Probably one of, it's one of the top three uh, outpatient total joint programs in the country. Uh, we had 1,000 with uh, six-month patient-reported outcome data and 18, uh, a subset of 1,898 patients who had complete complication data. So the insurance company actually supplies us uh, any kind of access to the uh, health system that the patients had so that we can reconcile complications with them on a monthly basis. You can see the age is a little younger, right? 
Um, and uh, the pay, the uh, these are all pri private pay patients in this study, right? These no Medicare patients in this. Next slide. These are the complications. We have an overall complication uh, rate, any kind of complication, complication at all, including medical of 5.5%, a, a, uh, a complication rate in, that with patients needing treatment of 3.5%. Next slide. Next slide. And patient satisfaction, you know, 97%. Next slide. This group was able to inc increase their margin per case. In other words, their profit per case in the ASC three times by implementing this program. And they saved Blue Cross Blue Shield $30 million a year in Mississippi. Is that the doctor or the entire company? I'm sorry? Is that just the doctor? That's, this is just the margin per case. Well, for everything. Correct, correct, in their surgery center. So their, margin, their, their profit margin per case went from $900 to $2,700 by implementing this program. <clears throat> Next, uh, next slide. And these are the outcomes. Uh, these are the KU scores or knee osteoarthritis scale uh, scores. Uh, the uh, patients reach a substantial clinical benefit by three months. Uh, this is the 36, uh, the 40, 3,600 patients. Next slide. Similarly with uh, unicompartmental knee replacement. Next slide. And the uh, WHO scores or hip osteoarthritis score for the uh, uh, total hip replacements. So the patients, uh, the outcomes are good. The costs are less, complications less. Next slide. Now, we looked at a subset of Medicare patients. We're doing about 500 Medicare patients a year now. And you'd think, well, okay, you know, we're really uh, worried about them because they're older, they're more frail, they have higher comorbidities. And yes, these patients are about 10 years older than the private pay patients, and their comorbidity indices are higher, but the results are the same. So at no point in the study, either pre-op or post-op, were the outcomes any different for the Medicare patients. So this can be done for a selected Medicare population also. And think about the, the savings to Medicare uh, are, are not as much because the, 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 what the surgery center gets from Medicare is less, but Medicare is saving about 13% on this. Next. Uh, and this is, you know, the literature is, uh, uh, indicates that you can certainly save money here, especially with decreased stays. Next. And this is a, a Truman market data scan that was done at uh, Boston uh, Hospital. Bill Creevy, and you know, but they saw what they found was that with an outpatient program, complications are less, outcomes are better, costs are less, and actually the best setting was a private ASC, where not only were the, the, the outcomes and complications the best there, but the profit margins for the people that ran the surgery center were the highest because they were able to negotiate better contracts with the hospital because they were focused on one thing and on one thing only. Next. Next. So in summary, the disease burden of osteoarthritis is going to continue to climb. Uh, to satisfy uh, the demands for this, we're going to need to change the way we do this and change the site of service. And um, uh, the migration of, uh, of in classically inpatient procedures, uh, not only total hips and total knees, but also spine procedures and other non-orthopedic uh, procedures is going to happen over the next uh, uh, 15 years. And it's really going to change uh, the way the healthcare is delivered and uh, when, uh, when we unfortunately have our total joints, most likely it's gonna be outpatient in some type of uh, freestanding center. And next slide. And uh, thank you from my family. Uh, this is on our uh, summer place block, Island, Rhode Island. And uh, no Holy Cross uh, kids yet, but there's, we're still hoping. Thank you very much. Any questions at all? That was uh, fantastic. Kind of a philosophical question that goes to the father's comments. Do you think the future medicine should be led by physicians or led by business? I think it should be led by physicians. And if it's not led by physicians, I think we're, I think patients will suffer. Uh, that's why I think it's very important for physicians to develop the business acumen that's necessary to manage uh, uh, healthcare. And that's you know sort of what I'm doing now, um, uh, because without physician leadership, um, uh, the patient gets lost in the in the in the equation. Um, and I've seen it both sides. You know, I'm a private practice guy for almost 30 years, and then I, I was involved with a uh, a large healthcare system. I can tell you the healthcare system is is very confused when it comes to the patient. They, they're not they're not they they claim to be patient centered, but they're 
they're centered on their organization, right? They're really there to, to, to make sure that their organization moves forward, um, not necessarily that patients get treated better. That's, to, that's an opinion. Uh, there's no doubt that physician that, or, physician that organizations have higher quality across the board. I'm sorry? I, I'm saying there's no doubt that physician led organizations show higher quality oh, scores. And, and that's, the, there is the literature that does reflect that. And that's the concern for the non physician leaders and organizations. Yes. So, and, and I think that one of the roles of this organization will be to, to promote physician leadership amongst Holy Cross graduates and, and, and students who want to seek a career in medicine. Uh, they, they need to know that they're not just going to go and practice medicine, they're going to be leaders in their community. I think it's a very important point. Physicians have traditionally been leaders in their community in the United States of America, right? So I was president of the Westchester County Medical Society, the oldest medical society in the United States. Those physicians in 1780 were the leaders. They were the most highly educated uh, in their communities, and they were they were they would led their communities. Right? Um, so, just a quick comment on that. In, in, in reading the statements of students right now and how they pitch themselves, they refer to their training at Holy Cross as steeping them in core personalis. And then you get this great personal statement of their instincts about community. I said, we need to market here core communitas so they can own that and, and ground what they're capable of doing and what the community needs in that reality here. We're doing it, but we're not naming it. A commitment to service for others is essential to being a good physician. All right. And on that note, uh, we'll go to uh, our next talk, uh, which I'm looking forward to big time. Um, unfortunately, I had a daughter who had um, a, a cancer, and um, so it affected our family big time. So I'm looking forward to this. Uh, Mary Jane Stava Hogan, uh, class of 86 grad. She went to medical school at University of Connecticut and a pediatric residency in a hematology oncology fellowship at the University of Chicago. Uh, she's then joined the faculty at Yale uh, New Haven and found time somehow to be, uh, get an MPH at uh, John Hopkins. Uh, she's currently the attending and assistant clinical professor of pediatric hematology at Yale New Haven. She's also published uh, uh, books and chapters and peer reviewed articles. And she's gonna speak to us today on advances in pediatric oncology and how they relate to primary care and subspecialty clinicians. Yeah, thanks for having me. And I hope to sort of give a broad overview uh, for people who have experienced cancer in their lives or taking care of people with cancer. They have no conflicts of interest and nothing to disclose. And I'm going to be reviewing epidemiology, some diagnostic developments, risk-based treatment modalities, supportive care, survivorship, and late effects. So first off, childhood and adolescent cancers are rare relative to adult cancers. There are about 16 cases um, per 100,000 US children per year and uh, ages less than 14 years. And then increasing to 72 cases per 100,000 in US adolescents and young adults, ages 15 to 39, compared to 953 cases for adults over uh, 40 years of age. So overall in the United States, there are about 10,000 cases per year in children less than 14, and about 5,000 cases per year in the United States in teenagers. And these slides are difficult to read, but on, the, on this side, my little pointer here. Um, I just wanted to go through the, the main types of cancers because they're different than adult cancers. More commonly in children, about 30% of cases are leukemia, about 26% of cases are CNS tumors, and about 10% uh, of cases are lymphomas. Whereas in teens, more of 20% uh, are epithelial, and epithelial tumors include thyroid, uh, skin, but ovarian and testicular cancers as well. CNS tumors are second at 20% and lymphomas are third at 20%. Um, so those are the majority. Um, and relatively over the past 50 years, um, we've had improvements in survival. In the mid seventies overall, there was less than a 50% uh, survival rate. 
Um, today, we can boast about an 84% survival rate in uh, children and adolescents. Obviously, we still have a long way to go. Our goal is 100%. Um, this 84% though um, impacts all of us though. We have about a half a million childhood cancer survivors that are adults now. So they're gonna come to your practice. Um, you're gonna need to take care of them because they do have some uh, issues and late effects. So how did we get to these improvements? Well, probably awareness, research, supportive care um, uh, are the most important advances. So first thing, what causes pediatric cancer? We know in adult cancers that over more than half of them are lifestyle cho choices, tobacco, obesity, alcoholism. And then kids, we really don't have that. So the majority of cases are unknown. We do know that 10% of them um, are from germline or inherited mutations. And there's over 50 um, familial cancer predisposition syndromes that we um, you know, want to do tumor surveillance on to catch them early. We do know that viruses are a big cause of uh, cancer, not huge, but the small cause, I should say small cause, but um, we see Epstein-Barr virus related lymphomas, we see HIV related sarcomas, but um, we also see um, HPV related um, cervical, head and neck and anal cancers. And we do know now that, that HPV vaccination prevents about 90% of these cancers. So, um, Make sure you get those kids vaccinated, males and females, and even the young adults that may not have been vaccinated yet. Um, parental exposures are a little bit vague. Uh, we know about ionizing radiation literally to the, the womb. Um, pesticides are still under investigation, but there are many meta-analysis. Um, however, uh, there are also uh, multifactorial issues involved with those meta-analysis. Um, we do see secondary cancers in children who have been previously treated with um, chemotherapy. And, and that is something um, that can occur within five to 10 years after completing their chemotherapy. And it's related to certain agents that they're exposed to. And I'll talk a little bit about that um, during the survivorship care. Uh, we think it's a combination of all these, uh, but we really still don't know. Otherwise, we try to prevent it with more vaccines or something. So there is increasing awareness. There are nonprofit organizations that help uh, parents and uh, healthcare providers on signs and symptoms of what to look for. Um, usually the presentation is a combination of symptoms, um, but overall I say anything that uh, persists and worsens, especially fevers, pains, lumps and bumps, um, fatigue that cannot be explained by simple infection or injury, um, please see your pediatrician um, and uh, have the child evaluated. Obviously, our field overlaps with immunology and rheumatology and infectious diseases, uh, among many other things. Um, uh, but uh, any child who has persistent and worsening symptoms should see their physician. Um, overall, um, we've seen improvements um, because we've looked at where we've failed. And in general, um, we've had a really hard time treating teenagers. And uh, as you can see, as the darker bar here is 1999 and 2014, we've been able to improve obviously, um, or decrease uh, mortality rates in every age group, including teens, but teens still having some of the higher uh, death rates. And uh, looking back on it, um, people were noticing that we weren't placing kids into clinical trials. These teens were being shuttled between sometimes the pediatric care centers, pediatric cancer centers, and sometimes adult centers. And a lot of adult centers are private practices, and they might not um, have access to uh, clinical trials or standard of care. We do know that in pediatrics that um, there is a higher survival rate when we get the kids enrolled into clinical trials. Um, these are phase three. They involve standard of care and then what's new, um, added on or subtracted to reduce toxicity. And they're followed very carefully. We, in terms of using a lot of other supportive care, we have uh, 
a whole group of administrators helping us um, like check every box off. What side effect have they had? Did they have all their labs drawn, et cetera, et cetera. So these um, treatment protocols are very detailed right now. And we find way better attention to care. It's like the checklist. Everybody heard about the quality improvement checklist. It's like a bundle. You got a bundle, here we go. And we find better outcomes. And we're getting teens more into clinical trials um, over time, as this study showed, um, because we're uh, one, opening up the trials to um, older ages. We now see kids less than 25 years of age who have uh, pediatric type cancers. We know that young adults less than 40 years of age who have a type of leukemia that kids typically have or a type of sarcoma that kids have or a lymphoma, that if, they're, um, they follow, if we follow them on our pediatric clinical trials, they have a higher survival rate than they would on the adult trials. Our trials are very aggressive. They're very intensive therapies. And believe it or not, a lot of young adults can handle that and uh, respond better. Um, we also, conversely, just to let you know, some of our kids, obviously, who have more adult type tumors respond better on the adult trials. So um, we've had a better communication with our um, adult oncologists, um, as well as broadening our reach with pediatric oncologists. I participate in <clears throat> children's oncology group, which is, involves about 200 different institutions in the United States. And um, we are definitely broadening out the age ranges so that we can capture more people um, and uh, improve survivors. We're also realizing uh, that there are disparities um, in outcomes by race and ethnicity. And uh, you know, here are the different types of tumors and um, here are survival rates and all these different colored groups are different um, races and ethnicities. And uh, you can see there's just inequality all around, no matter what the, the tumor type. And um, <clears throat> we're now looking into that in all of our protocols um, uh, and a lot of our younger um, trainees are looking into that more. So I don't have a slide on why that, how that has improved yet or what uh, it is, the issues are other than, um, it's probably inclusivity or uh, lack of access to the clinical trials or other social determinants of health uh, that we need to address. So lots of research still to go. But overall, we're improving diagnostics. You know, when I started out, uh, we kind of just had the tumor tissue and we looked under the microscope and we get some special stains and we hope to figure out, oh, this is a type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Maybe it's B, maybe it's T. We're not really sure. Oh, it looks like it's a combination. What do we do? So um, things advance with flow cytometry, looking at the molecular markers on the outside of the tumor cells so that um, let us look at you know, 10 to 100 fold more, more cells. And then the improvement in genetics have allowed us to look at thousand to hundreds of thousand fold more cells to see exactly what type of lymphocyte we're dealing with and the uh, mutations, translocations, alterations that may be targetable, but also um, we can um, place a lot of our kids' tumors into risk categories and tailor the uh, chemotherapies uh, to reduce toxicities and those who have uh, better responses to increasing um, intensity of therapy for better responses. Uh, we now use more um, dynamic imaging uh, throughout the course of therapy with PET and SPECT CTs where the infusion of radio tracer um, lets us look at the metabolic activity of the tumors. Uh, we used to only go by the CT scan size. Oh, it's not shrinking. Let's give more. Well, some of these tumors, especially non Hodgkin's lymphoma, are slow to regress. Um, and we may see even regression after we complete therapy, but we do notice that on PET, um, that there was decreased activity. Um, so it's, a, it's, it's been a remarkable improvement just within my lifetime. And overall, uh, cancer treatments are complicated in kids as they are in adults. Um, it's multimodality. Um, and even within each category, we use multi-agents. Um, but it's a combination approach. So in chemotherapy, um, 
we can now do genetic testing on kids to see if they have any metabolic indicators that would make them toxic to our therapy. So we had a, a lot of reduction in toxicity to uh, our uh, anti-metabolites and vincristin uh, by just doing genetic testing up front. So we can give enough dose to get rid of cancer but reduce um, problems. Uh, we base on uh, body surface area, obviously, but we uh, make adjustments throughout the therapy based on standard graded um, adverse events uh, so that the child doesn't have too many problems later on. And then I mentioned already the risk-based stratification um, within each cancer type. Um, it's been amazing for acute myelogenous leukemia. We have low risk cytogenetics and higher risk cytogenetics. And some of that is coming from our adult literature and some of it's coming uh, from our own genome products, genome, human genome projects coming out of St. Jude's or um, even Seattle. So it's a, it's a wonderful uh, case. But it's, what's confusing about all that genetics is in the old days, we would tell a family, this is what your child has, this is what the treatment, this is what's gonna happen for the next two and a half, three years, six months, whatever the situation. And now we're waiting on genetics um, for a couple of weeks, and then we're waiting on a response based on genetics. So um, it, it, it's hard to explain to a family what you're coming up toward because we can't right away tell you, okay, this seems standard risk, this is our plan. It could it could change into a higher risk category based on the the tumor markers that we um, find and or obviously the re response to therapy. For radiotherapy, um, in the old days we had a lot of entry and exit uh, damage to uh, normal tissue with uh, IMRT, uh, and it's quite conformal uh, and quite the process that has improved and reduced uh, the uh, radiation effects. We have stereotactic radiosurgery and radiotherapy and proton beam therapy, um, which was limited you know, about 10, 20 years ago is uh, actually, I guess a very profitable item, but it's uh, improving cancer uh, cure rates by reducing toxicity. Instead of using electron beams, the proton beams do not damage normal tissue. This has been quite helpful um, in the brain area, uh, especially um, in children uh, younger than five years of age. Um, in terms of immunotherapy, we find this some of our biggest breakthroughs. Um, we are now using them as uh, alone or in combination with chemotherapy or radiation therapy. And it's obviously based on tumor uh, specific antigens and immune modulation. And we can um, actually have uh, antibody therapy directed toward a particular uh, protein on uh, a tumor cell. Uh, there are still side effects with that in terms of um, uh, disrupting the immune system and um, causing immunosuppression. Um, we have oncolytic viral therapy. Um, that's a little bit. Uh, newer, um, but they are doing some injections even um, in brain tissue with that. Um, and then checkpoint inhibition, we're stealing from the adults um, where you turn off the tumor's ability to stop your immune system from recognizing it. And it allows your, your own T cells to recognize the tumor as, as foreign. Um, and we don't know all of all the late effects. We know the acute effects of all these, um, which are like uh, rheumatological manifestations, any type of inflammation that you can think of, as well as um, immunosuppression. Uh, but we think there may be some long-term effects in terms of increased risk of autoimmune disease. Uh, in terms of uh, stem cell transplant, um, uh, our latest data is we've done about 4,000 allogeneic in children and teens and about 3,000 autologous stem cell. And these are the stem cells. These are real stem cells. They, they, when people talk about stem cell therapy, I'm like, we've been doing bone marrow transplants for a while. These are stem cells that um, will form your red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Uh, we have better um, or higher levels of HLA uh, matching. Um, 
We do have a few more donors. We are lacking in many races and ethnicities, um, and even though the US is a very uh, multicultural, multi-ethnic um, uh, world for us, the, we don't have many donors. Um, approximately 40% of children will have, find a, a matched donor um, from a family member. Uh, and that may increase by uh, 10 or 10% 10 or so, a fully matched um, uh, non-related donor. Uh, and then we uh, are improving uh, our transplant um, options by allowing more half low uh, identical donors um, using uh, lower intensity preparatory regimens um, if possible. And, uh, also trying to prevent uh, graft versus host disease and improving supportive care. In fact, we have more protocols almost on supportive care uh, for our transplant um, individuals than we do for the actual regimen. Regimens vary throughout the country um, and that hasn't been as standardized as our uh, chemotherapy protocols. So I think um, it would be great if that could be more standardized uh, so that we can move this field along as well. Targeted therapies uh, have been just a wonderful uh, godsend to us. Um, the, when they're in phase one trials, we use them alone. When we're in phase three trials, we use them in combination. Here are some of the um, mutation targets that we can, uh, can, can have a, an appropriate drug therapy for. A lot of these targets cross different types of cancers. So, um, this has opened up our field uh, a little bit more in terms of graft mutations. You say, oh, okay, that's, uh, that's melanomas, right? No, that's medulloblastomas. That's a brain tumor uh, in children. We can use this agent. Um, so it's been um, alpha tumors. Oh, it's only lymphomas. No, we, we find them in relapsed sarcomas. You know? So it's, a, it's, a, it's still an unexplored, um, I don't know all the effects other than uh, we've seen uh, improved uh, two and five year survival rates by at least 10% in certain um, appropriate uh, uh, tumors with these markers. Um, as of um, the past five years or so, uh, Children's Oncology Group um, is using their uh, genetic uh, testing capability on relapsed tumors. Um, and we're trying to match uh, potential targets to a current therapy that may not be available um, to children as of yet. And um, in two, as of 2019, out of 422 children who had relapsed tumors, and these are cases where uh, there is no other option. They've already done transplant. They've done everything that we can we found up to 24% of targetable genetic mutations. So we didn't expect that. We thought it'd be around six to 10%. Um, and we're not sure if it's a, there's a bias in terms of the, the kids coming um, from institutions that already checked their, these tumor tissues for these targets and then um, send the child in, or if the tumors themselves are mutating in such a way um, that uh, the, you know, the actual relapsed tumor, the initial tumor didn't have this mutation, but the relapsed tumor does. Um, and the outcomes of this are to be determined, but at least we're finding a target. Um, CAR-T, you probably all heard about, has been uh, an amazing um, uh, invention for our particularly relapsed acute lymphoblastic leukemia, especially for kids who have already had a transplant. Um, and uh, it, it involves literally taking T cells from somebody, engineering them to uh, target the, the uh, tumor, um, multiplying them and then infusing them back. So sort of like a stem cell transplant, but modifying. And uh, there are more centers doing this. Uh, Yale starting it. We are a very small uh, program, but we're actually starting it because you really do need the staff for the um, huge cytokine storm that um, occurs uh, during this process. Um, 
very high doses of, of steroids um, and uh, blood pressure support, et cetera. Um, but it, it does knock out the uh, leukemia. And um, in terms of the different types, I didn't put the uh, response rates here, but uh, for children who traditionally had a survival less than 20%, it, it has improved their rates of survival 40 to 50% um, overall. Um, so th this has been an amazing, we're now brand branching out. Uh, Texas is doing this for our um, relapsed uh, rhabdomyosarcomas, uh, especially if they have, well, uh, some type of targetable lesion on their sarcoma, like a, a HER2 receptor or something like that. So we have our survivors. We have over half a million survivors. About 40% of them will go on to have one or more chronic issues afterwards. So we do um, want our pediatricians and adult colleagues to um, keep track of these kids for us. Uh, we have uh, childhood cancer survivorship clinics um, in most states now. We recommend at least a one-time visit um, because we're monitoring for these effects. We come up with a care plan, which I'll sh show you in a minute, uh, for our uh, primary care doctors to follow and our subspecialists to, to help us with. So we see kids with osteonecrosis who need joint replacements and they're in their early 20s. We have kids who have strokes and heart attacks um, in their 20s as well because they receive chest radiation or anthracyclines. So we do rely on everybody. So. Uh, big component of a side effect or growth and development, especially with the radiation to the brain, but also our intrathecal chemotherapies, our regular organ toxicities. And these late effects may not manifest during the treatment. We obviously do have many acute side effects and we need many different supportive cares uh, and, and help with that. But these may manifest after treatment is over. Um, fertility and preservation I'm gonna, and reproduction, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. Um, uh, psychosocial is a huge component that's often overlooked. Uh, uh, ch childhood cancer survivors typically do not achieve as higher rate of uh, higher levels of education. They do have more unemployment, uh, do have difficulty getting health insurance, um, and can suffer from PTSD or anxiety. Um, and so we want uh, people to be more aware of that, saying, "No, that's not you. We can get you help for that." Um, you're, you're still recovering from your uh, childhood or adolescent cancer. And secondary cancers, as I've mentioned, um, uh, are a, a, a small percentage. It, it, it's anywhere from two to 5%, depending on the um, types of therapy received, but um, it can increase to over 40% um, it, or 40 fold increase uh, as you age, so over 40 years of age, you'll have an increased risk of cancer, more than the general uh, population. So in terms of preventing second cancers, we want uh, lifestyle choices to be made as well. So um, how do we prevent some of these problems? Well, um, we have our uh, uncle fertility team helping us before we even start treatment. Once the children are diagnosed, we uh, get them uh, to, uh, visit our uncle fertility clinic if it's a therapy that we think will affect their um, fertility. And as you know, we do uh, sperm donation and um, for the uh, oocyte stimulation, we give uh, 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 hormones uh, to stimulate that so we can collect that. But um, the later, th the newer therapies are to actually freeze um, ovarian or testicular tissue. Uh, and we're not sure of the outcomes of those just yet, um, but uh, families are willing to uh, do that. Now the children don't understand what's going on. Um, I had a 14 year old who gave me a sample of urine in a cup. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a very difficult thing to achieve. Um, when you've just been told you have cancer or your parents have just been told that you have cancer, that your child has cancer, and uh, this is the furthest thing from their mind um, most of the time, but we're trying. And um, we have a whole committee on childhood cancer survivorship and guidelines that are updated every three to four, five years. Um, and uh, based on the 
treatment that was received. Uh, we tell physicians um, what to expect in terms of long-term toxicity and how to monitor for it. And um, how would a, an adult internist know what, you know, their 30 year old received when they were five years of age. Well, that's why we want them to come to our childhood cancer survivorship clinic. We see people as old as 65 um, and we find their records and we make a comprehensive letter for them and um, sort of summarize this 300 page or more document of what their risks would be and what type of screening they would need in terms of heart ultrasounds or if they had uh, osteopenia um, uh, or a porosis, what they would need to, to do to um, prevent further damage. So um, it's been uh, very helpful um, also in terms of screening for secondary cancers. So when a 20 year old who survived Hodgkin says they have chest pain, comes to your emergency room, you want to treat them as a heart attack <laughs> a victim and and put them on the, you know, get, get your levels, get your cardiotropin levels and, um, and your imaging as necessary. So how can we help? Well, prevention is great. Um, if you find a child with a cancer predisposition syndrome or a family with one, um, uh, we would love to do the tumor surveillance on the children. Um, we pr promote nutrition exercise, um, avoiding smoking, vaping. Well, I don't know what's in vaping. We don't know what's going on with that and some protection on all our kids. We would love uh, adult physicians, pediatric physicians, if they come across any children, adolescents or young adults who may have a pediatric type cancer to consider uh, a children's hospital that takes care of uh, cancer um, or that's one that's affiliated with an adult center so that we can get them the, the best possible uh, care available and access to some of the newer agents um, we always need to limit barriers to health access. Um, so, uh, you know, insurance, we have social workers to help us. Uh, any way that you can help would be great. Um, we love to talk about clinical trials. Uh, people hear that and they're like, I don't want to be the guinea pig, but literally our trials are standard of care and standard of care plus something or slightly removing something based on their risks, we would never put a child at risk or put them in as a complete experiment. And we certainly take them off the trials if um, we think we can get something better um, for them. Um, we um, proving supportive care to decrease acute toxicities during treatment. We like our children to go to our, their pediatricians or our teens to go to their internists or I mean their family practitioners or our young adults to go to their internists once a year to catch up on what they need to do. Obviously we cannot give vaccines uh, during our treatments, but uh, we want them to feel uh, that they do have a, a life after cancer and that um, staying in touch with their primary care doctor um, is very important for that. Um, and in terms of monitoring for late effects, we ask every primary or subspecialty clinician if you come across a person who has had a previous history of cancer, even if they're adult, they have adult cancer, ask them, do you know what therapy you received? Do you know what your risk factors are for whatever? No, I don't. Okay. Well, even the adult cancer, um, the adult oncologists are um, providing survivorship letters for uh, adult survivors of cancer so that they can um, not have as many side effects um, from therapies. And that's it. Is uh, cardiotoxicity different in your adolescents or older groups that say adults that have uh, chemotherapy for cardiotoxic agents? Is the incidence the same or is it different? It's a little bit lower. Uh, we used to have maximum doses of our anthocyclines up to 400 to 450 milligrams per meter squared um, total dose. And now we've cut that back to 200 to 250. So um, you might see some adult survivors of childhood cancer from 20, 30 years ago who did receive that higher doses of anthracycline. Um, uh, children's hearts seem to be uh, more uh, resilient uh, and they can handle higher doses, um, uh, but we are cutting back because we, we just know from there. So 
we see a little bit less than the adults do. Um, we're also uh, doing a little less uh, chest radiation <laughs> than we've done in the past. We used to treat um, a certain type of Hodgkin's sometimes just with chest radiation. <laughs> And now we can actually treat it with chemo um, and avoid radiation um, in certain groups. Uh, but we don't um, do, we do TTEs. We only send them for left ventricular, left ventricular ejection fraction and shortening fractions. But you've got me thinking PFOs and <laughs> <laughs> interpulmonary shunting. And I'm like, oh, I think we're missing something here. Um, but now we do talk about lifestyles and, and telling them to try to decrease those risks of heart disease. I've collected a lot of umbilical cord blood samples in the hopes that those would be harvested as some form of stem cells. Are, are they using those? Yes, for sure. I'm sorry, I didn't mention that. Okay. It just seemed like such a big, <laughs> such a big topic. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> We love umbilical cord and we can do double umbilicals on bigger kits. So it's usually a volume issue of the amount of stem cells, right? But we can actually do two different umbilical cords if they're closely matched. What's great about umbilical cords, even though they take a little, little longer to engraft, um, they are less, um, there's less acute graft versus host and chronic graft versus host because these are really prime, you know, stem cells. Um, which is lovely, uh, not exposed to any, you know, um, any, well, mom had chemicals too, but not as many as somebody who's been around for 10 years here, my stem cells, you know, or 50 years or whatever. So the, um, I don't know the exact number to date of umbilical. It's still a little bit lower than um, bone marrow. So we still collect bone marrow the old fashioned way. Our second option is umbilical, and our third is peripheral stem cell collection. You think peripheral stem cell collection would be great. Just give somebody GCSF and some steroids, and you're going to collect some cells, but they don't tend to engraft as well, um, and they do have a little bit more risk of graft versus cells. So we love umbilical. We'd encourage everybody. It's a great thank you for doing saying that. Everybody to donate their placenta. Some families ask us if they should save it for themselves. We typically say no. Believe it or not, um, if you do, if you have a family member with cancer, you can obviously use your child's umbilical, your next child's umbilical, if they're not impacted or have an inherited familial predisposition syndrome, depending, so that has to be worked up um, to see if it's appropriate. Um, and some families do um, carry those genes, and so the umbilical cord is not appropriate. Um, but uh, uh, we check those before giving them to other people uh, as well. Um, but so as, and we don't recommend a bill court for that child um, because we really don't know if the mutation happened in the stem cells and just didn't express itself until one year of age or until five years of age. It's, uh, there's a lot of unknown. Great question. Yeah. Uh, in, at the midpoint of my career, I started seeing more papillary thyroid cancers in patients that had childhood non uh, Hodgkin's disease treated with radiation therapy. So, is that a small population of people that's going to go away? Because it seemed like these were kids that, told, that were told, oh, I, I, I don't have any issues. Maybe they worried about cardiac issues, but all of a sudden they get to be 35 and 40 and they have an aggressive papillary thyroid cancer. Yeah, yeah, so thyroid, um, our secondary cancers most common are thyroid, skin, and breast. And some Is that of that, radiation? It's due to, it was our radiation for our Hodgkins. We used a lot. I mean, we used it instead of chemo in some that we thought were lower risk, oh, let's just give radiation. Um, and, uh, you know, they used to use radiation to treat acne. I mean, you know, I'm, you, you, your thyroid is just sitting there <laughs> help, you know? So, um, yeah, we're reducing uh, the radiation, reducing radiation doses. Um, we're making decisions as people are responding to their Hodgkin's lymphoma uh, to determine whether they, instead of getting six courses, they'll just get four courses of chemotherapy without radiation or six courses without radiation. We almost have it as a fallback. Oh, 
you need radiation to prevent relapse, although you can treat relapse in Hodgkin's now too, uh, but it's much stronger therapy. Don't get me wrong, all the kids go through hell even if we don't give them radiation, you know, and even if we use umbilical cord or whatever, they all go, go through a lot. Um, so it's less common now. It's going to be, hope. well, that's our goal, right? We haven't used proton beam yet um, for the Hodgkin's, you know, uh, but we are doing more immune, immune modulary for the Hodgkin's. So the hope is in 20, 30 years, yes, there will be less. A real testament to uh, to modern medicine, correct? And think about the advances that have been made in uh, pediatric oncology over the last uh, 60, 70 years. Ma amazing, right? So now on to the general. Uh, there actually was a, a revolutionary uh, uh, general who was a physician, and that was Joseph Warren of Boston. And interestingly enough, during the Battle of Boston, he sent his family to Worcester. So Mike uh, is a 1978 grad, uh, graduate of Holy Cross, went on to medical school at Georgetown, like everybody else, I guess, and then went into the Navy and was a flight surgeon in Pensacola, New River, North Carolina, Monterey, California, and then Norfolk, Virginia. He, uh, he also trained in pediatrics at Children's Hospital Norfolk and became a medical student education coordinator for the Uniformed Services University, or USIS, which is an amazing, amazing institution at Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, he went on to become chair of pediatrics of both National Naval Medical Center, Portsmouth, and uh, Naval Medical Center, San Diego. And then he switched gears, right? This is a very interesting career. Uh, and he did a sleep medicine fellowship at Stanford. Uh, and currently leads the sleep medicine division at Naval Medical Center, Portsmouth, and he's going to speak to us today on sleep medicine. Your questions answered. Yeah, thanks, Lewis. You know, when the father talked earlier about uh, the quote from Newman about the, all the changes. Yeah. Uh, I've, uh, I've been through it. So, um, let's see. So, uh, so sleep for crusaders. I based uh, this talk on questions I got from people on the listserv, basically. Um, uh, first, I just want to mention that uh, 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 somnology. I actually prefer that term. Uh, it's like cardiology. You know, people just said, well, I'm going to the heart doctor. I'm going to see the heart physician just doesn't have it you know you need that that greek or latin root to fret have a more seriousness to it so somnology uh the study of sleep and then uh, i always have issues with powerpoint um i've actually become more of a powerpoint kind of guy my notes are like powerpoints now they're uh, almost never a complete sentence all just bullets and, and keywords and such uh, that said, PowerPoints had its weaknesses. I don't think too many people know it, but both uh, both um, shuttle disasters, uh, the uh, inappropriate use of PowerPoint were factors uh, in those both those mishaps. Um, and there's a guy at Yale named Tufty, who's uh, big into uh, uh, communicating data visually. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of his, and he's very critical of PowerPoint as well. But in any case, here we are. Uh, doing, uh, and then um, uh, coming here and, and giving this presentation, I'm reminded of uh, when I first started Holy Cross. My very first exam was in chemistry, uh, interdynamic chemistry. I think her name was Brown. Joyce Brown. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, the, as I remember, the class was like at 8.30 in the morning. Well, I woke up at 8.30 that day of that first exam, and I just, I freaked out. Uh, 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 and I ran down. I didn't even have to put a shirt on. I just put a jacket on and some shoes on and, and, and ran down. I got there like, you know, 15 minutes into the test and was just all stressed out, and I got a D. 
<laughs> it was just not very inauspicious start, you know, and I still have a little you know, nightmares and PTSD <laughs> uh, from that. So the next one. Okay. And then one reason I, I decided to uh, throw out uh, this talk to the listserv uh, was, well, you know, I could talk about so many things, but I didn't want to get off on something too narrow in scope. And I was reminded of, of how important it is to pick the right topic. And uh, as this guy did here, our friend, the beaver. <laughs> so this is my version of that. So it's a little bit lighter fare than I think the other talks. I have nothing to disclose, um, <laughs> sadly. Um, uh, and then, okay. Uh, uh, just a second. Got a few extra things here that I added late. Oh, oh well, you know, my, my interest in sleep medicine actually predates my interest in medicine. Uh, inter I'm interested in sleep, rather. I, I remember uh, being interested in sleep when I was in grade school, actually. Uh, but there was no established career path for sleep when I came through back in the day. It was a research item, if anything at all, uh, then. But eventually it, it came into its own, and I uh, uh, found my way home, as it were, eventually. Next one. Okay, first question. How much, sleep do, how much sleep do people need? Well, they've actually done studies or made consensus statements, and the, it's thought that most people need seven or more uh, uh, per, uh, per night. That said, there's that, not quite a bell-shaped curve, but there's a distribution, there's some variation, right? But let it be said that some of these guys that say they get by with very little sleep, that there are studies that show that there's all sorts of bad things that go along with that. And I love this quote, you know, the number of people who get five hours of sleep or less without impairment expressed as a percentage of the population rounded to a whole number is zero. <laughs> um, now, this talk, uh, the way I, I should have mentioned before, the way I like to do these PowerPoint talks is in the notes page view, I put all sorts of details, references and such. So the real value of this talk is actually afterwards, if somebody wanted to look at it, it, it it's a, pretty much a standalone document, uh, unlike most PowerPoints, uh, uh, in my opinion. So I'll be sending it out to everybody. Um, so if, 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 if we don't get to everything here, because we are running a little late, everything's in the, in the PowerPoint. Okay. How do you know if you're getting enough sleep? These are a few questions that I routinely think of. Uh, when I'm, when I'm thinking of whether my patient is getting enough. Assuming a typical Monday through Friday type schedule, if you answer yes to any of these questions, uh, you got to think you're either not getting enough sleep or the quality of your sleep is not what it should be. Next one. Okay. Then there's the whole aspect, and I had a few questions that related to this in some general way about, well, gee, I didn't, when I was a resident, we, you know, especially back when I came, my age group, when we came through, you often didn't sleep very much at all. And there was, there's always this attitude of, well, you know, when I was a resident and I turned out okay. Um, and, and there's a lot to be said for that. I'm a, I have mixed feelings about these new ACGME rules uh, uh, and, and such. I think there's a lot to be said for taking ownership of a, pa of a patient and no matter how long it takes to, to, to get what needs to be done. And that just sort of attitude that it, it, it endears that maybe there isn't so much of in medicine nowadays. That said, there are certainly some issues with this whole idea of, of, of going without sleep. Halstead, um, who's a, a true giant in medicine, uh, he was the head of uh, uh, surgery at Hopkins for about 30 years. And he is his residency uh, that he developed there was really the progenitor of all residencies, at least uh, in North America. Uh, and he had, a, he was influenced a lot by how they did things in Germany. Uh, but in any case, he developed a system of a, a pyramid like system where uh, uh, over the course of about eight years, there was some variability in it. Um, People uh, who were uh, his staff, and that's where the word resident comes from, because his staff were residents. They lived in the hospital. They were expected to be there all the time. Uh, had this pyramid system, uh, and such that 
uh, over the course of 30 years, he only had 17 that completed the complete, you know, two year chief resident position. Anyway, he had all these layers uh, of folks just working their butts off. And he was, you know, no slacker himself, of course, but he was also a cocaine addict. And uh, he also uh, used morphine and such. And it is thought by other, and like there's references in, again, the notes page that those layers, those buffers <laughs> allowed him to hide his addictions and such. So a, 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 a dark side to a, an otherwise fantastic and impressive career. Uh, next slide. So there's this whole idea of, of chronic sleep deprivation uh, that uh, sort of ties into that in a way. And uh, here's a quote from Matthew Walker, who's a, a sleep specialist out at Berkeley. Humans are the only species that deliberately deprive themselves of sleep for no apparent reason. Um, chronic uh, sleep uh, illness is associated with many things, and I list those in the notes page view. Uh, it also impacts the glymphatic system, which I'll get into in, in a few slides further. Uh, operating on less than five hours of sleep, the risk of motor vehicle accidents triples, and it increases exponentially with further sleep loss. Sleep deprivation can be used as torture. Uh, under the euphemism, usually the euphemism you, you'll see in these uh, documents is prisoner sleep management is what they call it. Uh, but uh, if you deprive someone of sleep, we don't really, those studies have never been done and never will be done. But in a rat, if you deprive the, sleep, the rat of sleep, they die at about 15 days on average. And the usual cause of death is septicemia. All the systems break down and eventually it's the immune system that gives away and leads to death. <clears throat> What's the purpose of sleep anyway? Sleep goes back a, a millennia. Uh, it uh, warms sleep. So it actually predates vertebrate uh, evolution, uh, the idea of sleep. And in fact, there's some people who think that sleep, the state of sleep existed before the state of wake. There's really three states that you're in normally. You're either awake, you're in dream sleep, you're in non-dream sleep. That's it. There is nothing else. And of course, while you're asleep, you can't eat, drink, gather food, hunt, reproduce, or ostensibly do any productive work. Further, you are defenseless and easy prey. So uh, with all that negative, there must be an incredible positive uh, to, to make it anywhere halfway justifiable from an evolutionary perspective. Um, and one way to think of sleep is to think of it uh, like food. Getting calories, getting nutrition is non-negotiable. You absolutely have to get it. When you get it, how much you get, how it's done, there's all sorts of cultural uh, learned uh, aspects to that. Uh, so, and sleep is, is like that. It's a mixture of those two things. But there is that underlying uh, biology and necessity. Uh, and this was discovered uh, less than 10 years ago. Uh, and this is a big part of the purpose of sleep is the lymphatic system. It's been known for a long time that there really were no lymphatics for the central nervous system. And it was nobody really quite knew, well, how does, how does the central nervous system handle such things? Well, in 2012, uh, they discovered that uh, the, the, the glymphatic system, and basically they're these uh, astroglial cells uh, form a tunnel around the arteries. CSF comes in, and then during sleep, the channels open, the flow goes across, and then into the, on the other side into veins. And during deep sleep, the astroglial cells shrink and this space actually, interstitial space actually increases. So when you have deep sleep, next slide. So when you have deep sleep, there you go, there's my visual. That, that's not quite Marcus's level, but I have one. <laughs> <laughs> but when you're in deep sleep, that is N3 sleep, that's when most waste products are taken care of, including amyloid, okay? 
uh, you have less deep sleep, you have less N3 sleep, the older you get. And the, the deep sleep that you do have is less deep, okay? And N3 sleep is associated also with, with, with learning new things. So not only you do not, as you get older, have trouble maintaining waste products, including amyloid and therefore risk for dementia, but also your ability to learn new things uh, goes down as you get older. And thus the adage, you know, an old can't teach an old dog new tricks. Um, and then uh, just to describe this a little more detail, a CSF travels from the choroid plexus into the subarachnoid, sp subarachnoid space, and then into the periarterial lymphatic system, and then mixes with waste products in the interstitial space, and then by conductive fl convective flow, passes into the peri perivenous lymphatic system, and then into the lymphatic system, and then into the systemic circulation. Next slide. And this is a good one that sh shows how it's, uh, it's associated uh, impairment to the lymphatic system and, and with age, the less deep sleep, it's associated with uh, Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of thought now that if we could come up with uh, treatments that increase deep sleep in older patients, it can help prevent. And there are a number of medications that actually do this and the studies are, are starting to be looked at. Next one. Okay. Another question that came up was, well, why do we dream? Well, again, uh, uh, there's these different stages of sleep and, and dreaming occurs primarily in REM sleep. Well, what's the purpose of REM sleep? Well, it turns out that uh, if you look at uh, species, across species, only mammals and birds have clearly defined REM sleep. And even aquatic animals like dolphins, we're not so sure they have REM sleep. Um, because uh, when you have REM sleep, you have a total loss of, of muscle tone. And that would not be a good thing if you're a dolphin. In this one. So, uh, but part of what goes on during REM sleep is uh, we think uh, what sets it apart is that it helps with emotional balance, which in turn helps with our social networks and what sets us apart as a species. For example, with primates, primates sleep, other primates sleep a lot more than humans. Uh, typical, let's say a gorilla, a chimpanzee sleeps 10 to 15 hours a day, but they only have 9% dream sleep. We sleep about eight hours a day, but about 20, 25% dream sleep. That dream sleep is also thought to be more related to creativity. During dreams, you're making all these connections that on the surface, maybe don't make sense. I mean, dreams are weird, right? But they're also the source of a lot of creativity. Well, the other stages of sleep may very well be involved with uh, memory consolidation of different types and learning. The creativity and the emotional balance probably comes more from uh, uh, stage R sleep, dream sleep, which does not change over the course of a lifetime, how much dream sleep you have on a percentage basis. Okay. Let's see, next one, yeah, okay. Another question came up, ah, restless legs. Is that really a thing? Is that really? Well, I can tell you that it is because it's, it's key to how I got into sleep medicine for one thing. Uh, I had symptoms as a kid. I, I didn't even know what to make out of it. I just that was, I took it for granted. I didn't, didn't think much of it. But then I was in med school. And it was either in Cecil or Harrison's. They were the two big internal medicine textbooks at the time. I can't remember which one. One of them I'm reading, I can't remember what I was reading about. But it made reference to, in the differential, restless legs needed to be considered. Restless leg syndrome needed to be considered. Go, oh, wow, that, that doesn't sound like, that's a real thing. Well, my legs get restless, they, they've always gotten restless at times. Hmm. So I go to the index and it refers me back it's only one page, that page. That was it. <laughs> Seriously, that was it. Okay, so there was, and this is before the internet and everything. So, so that was it. It wasn't until years later, when I'm in San Diego, that I come across a pediatric article about growing pains. And now growing pains very often is actually restless legs. And in reading it and the description that was so very well written, 
I go, oh yeah, that's me. I get it. Yeah, it all makes sense now. So I wander upstairs to where the sleep guys were at the time. Uh, most of them at, at, at the time at, at there were neurologists. And I talked to one of them and gave me some medicine for it that night. It was, a, it was clear cut. Anyway, I really had restless legs. It was a key to how I got into medicine because then that led to a further conversations with the sleep guys. Before I knew it, I found my way up to stand. Uh, uh, then there's this uh, tangential to that. There's restless leg syndrome. And then there's what's called periodic limb movement disorder. Okay, next slide. Uh, there's sort of two sides of the same coin. When you have restless legs, it, it's by definition hard to describe a sensory experience. Okay. It's very subjective. It occurs while you're awake. It varies a lot and relieved briefly by, mo by, by movement. And it can impact you falling asleep. Periodic limb movements is a motor thing while you're asleep, we can actually measure it rather precisely, but it also varies a lot. It's also relieved move by movement. So people are twitching, kicking their legs at night. Because it's really the same phenomenon, this subjective, this sensory uh, uh, feeling is still going on on sublim some love, subliminal level and it's relieved by movement. So it can mimic insomnia. Uh, and I, I, I see it all the time. Uh, people refer to the sleep uh, sleep clinic uh, for insomnia problems, and they really have uh, restless legs or periodic limb movement disorder, or or some combination of the two. Next slide. Okay. What kind of sleep studies are there? Okay. There were a few questions that sort of tied into this. Okay. The the big one you see, I think, a lot in the private practice world, the home sleep apnea test. We'll talk about that in a moment, and then there's the diagnostic polysomnogram, titration studies. A therapy of polyphenol, which is basically a variation of a titration one. And then there's the mean sleep, late need sleep test. And then there's actigraphy. You don't see actigraphy much in the private sector, but we use it where I'm at. You see it uh, uh, in private practice, it loses money. It loses money. So not, almost nobody has it in private practice. But at major institutions that are involved in education or have a mission uh, 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 beyond uh, 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 trying to make money, you'll, you'll, you'll see it. So anyway. We have where we are in there. There's, I'm going to talk about that in a minute, too. Uh, next slide. So only sleep apnea test. Now, we use these all the time. I think it's important to realize that they are designed for a certain patient population. They're designed for guys my age, especially guys my age who are overweight. That's who it's designed for. It's not a good test for a 22-year-old uh, who's lean and fit just not a, a good test, um, but it's used inappropriately all the time nonetheless because it's cheap and the insurance companies want things done cheap. Next slide. Uh, please interpret uh, the, the jargon, okay? Next slide, okay. So this is uh, taken from a diagnostic polyxamia re re report of an actual patient of mine a while back. And I, this is basically how mine is presented. now. There's no, things are not all that standardized out there uh, with sleep uh, medicine reports. There, I mean, there's key things there, but how it's actually presented is, varies a lot. Even within my institution, my reports look very different than my buddy Bill's, okay, and, and et cetera. But just to go over some of the, I, I'll often describe why am I doing this test, okay? And then in the results, uh, in the notes page view, I go into all these numbers and explain what the normal range is, okay? Uh, so I think if you ever wanted to have a reference to look at a sleep study, that little chunk would be very valuable to you. So the line in the sand for a sleep apnea was an ap apnea apopnea index of a five if they're symptomatic, okay? So this guy crossed the line just barely, okay? But his oxygenation is this PO2, dipped down to 80 and it was real. Often you'll see reports where it's 80 and it's bogus and nobody bothers to, to clarify that. And I hate that, it's a pet peeve of mine. So if I see something like that, I will actually tell you whether it's real or not. And so this guy did. So uh, he actually crossed the line into, into having sleep apnea. He 
also started dreaming a little on the early side. Now that by itself really doesn't mean a whole lot, but it's typically closer to 90 minutes. And then he had periodic limbum was asleep, this last paragraph. The line in the sand here is 15. The line in the sand over here is five. Okay, and this is that twitching. And we have a, a strict rule for how that's defined on a sleep study. This is just those movements in general. And these are those movements that clearly showed uh, evidence of disturbing his sleep. No, no, no doubt about it. Okay, next slide. Multiple sleep latency tests, what we use for narcolepsy. It all comes down to this grid. And the key thing you're looking for is how long did it take him uh, to, uh, to fall asleep? And anything less than eight minutes is abnormal. And then did he have dream sleep of at least two? So this guy's, this study is actually consistent with narcolepsy. Next slide. Okay. Actigraphy, again, you don't see this done much in the, on, on private practice, but this is normal, okay? On a sleep, on an actigraphy, all these black is movement. All these different colors are different wavelengths of light, okay? So if you want to get in the weeds, I can actually often tell you whether that light is coming from a computer screen versus a TV screen, whether you're indoors or outdoors, fluorescent light, incandescent light. I almost never need to go there, but, there, but you can actually get into the weeds on this. So this is actually a fairly normal. Look how consistent the bedtime is. I mean, that's better than me, I tell you that. And next one. This is a delayed sleep phase. You see this all, we see this all the time around now. Uh, I, I see mostly active duty patients, uh, young, healthy population, and de delayed sleep phase syndrome is much more common in that group. And they just have this natural tendency to stay up late, which as you might imagine in the military, which has a tendency to get going early in the morning, can be a bit of a problem. When I was at uh, Stanford, of course, we didn't have the military there, but the only time you saw a delayed sleep phase syndrome being a problem was one of, one of two situations. One, the guy started out, okay, let's say he was in high school, smart guy, stayed up late all the time, got into college, manipulated his schedule, never had a class before noon, did great. Started working at Google. Most of the jobs at Google don't have strict hours. You're part of a team. Your team is given a task. You got a deadline. When and how you guys do that, eh, up to you. So he's doing great. Well, for whatever reason, he leaves Google. He goes to work for Bank of America. There's a different culture at Bank of America. Okay? Uh, so he got fired from Bank of America. We see him after he's he's in a, it's eight months after he left Google. He's been on five or six different jobs, and each one either he left or he got fired because he cannot adapt uh, to that schedule. The other situation is this guy like that meets a girl. She lives in the more normal world, and he wants to have a relationship with her, and she's not so interested in playing World of Warcraft at three in the morning. She wants to go to movies and dinner in the early evening. So either one of those two things happen. Now, if he had stayed at Google and wasn't interested in a romantic relationship, or if he was an artist living in New York, doing his bohemian life, it, it wouldn't have mattered. It would have been okay. And delayed sleep phase tends to get better as you get older. It doesn't always. I've definitely seen it in elderly folks. But anyway, that's a typical delayed sleep phase that you see. And we see that all the time. Next slide. This is clearly different than the first slide, okay? Uh, at this point, now, now Bill, I got this from my, my, my cohort, okay, because there's the idea of sleeping on something. So I was thinking about, dreaming about, well, not, this wasn't much dreaming, but in my working through things, probably in my stage N2 sleep, I was thinking about my talk. And I woke up and it, with the idea, oh, I should add actigraphy. So I called my buddy, uh, Bill, uh, back who I work with, and I had him send this to me. So he writes all over his stuff. In any case, that's it's from him. But you can see, 19 hours. This patient slept 19 hours solid there and other times. There's, this patient has idiopathic hypersomnia with really bad uh, sleep hygiene. 
And here Bill actually, he broke out. This is Xbox as opposed to a TV. So this guy's up playing Xbox, you know, so he's got these really bad habits. And then he's just, idiopathic hypersomnia comes to two flavors. But you need more sleep or your, your sleep amount of sleep is normal. This guy needs more sleep. So between the two things, it's totally screwed up. And you, as you can imagine, this is a problem in the military for him. Uh, next slide. Okay. And this is something I just uh, wanted to bring up myself. Um, uh, light pollution. It's, it's indirectly related to, to sleep, but, but, it, but it's a big part of it. Um, and how we do things these days. Next slide. For years, I've noticed that there weren't as many lightning bugs, fireflies, as when I was a kid. And I thought, well, why is that? So what happened? I, is it insecticides? It's the same thing happened to them that's happened to bees? Well, recently I, I read some articles. I learned that it's actually light pollution. So this light at night that affects us in our sleep and, 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 and what, what uh, is unnatural for us that we live in and causes problems, it's happening throughout uh, other areas of nature. And the lightning bugs that, uh, that come out at dusk and at twilight rely on it being dark enough for there to be a lot of contrast between their flashes and the background. If the background is lighter, they actually have trouble seeing each other and finding each other and mating and such. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, pearls, just a, a a few pearls because somebody asked, somebody had asked for that. Just give me give us some pearls. Okay, okay, okay. The difference between fatigue and sleepiness because people use the word tired all the time. Well, tired can mean different things to different people in different situations. I think it's very helpful to distinguish between fatigue and sleepiness. Fatigue is when you're pooped, you're worn out, you don't feel like doing anything. Okay. Sleepiness is when you're, oh gosh, if I could get a nap in. If I just slept a little bit longer, I'd be doing a whole lot better. Now you can have both, okay? Uh, but it's an important distinction. People that have sleep apnea tend to be sleepy. People who are depressed tend to be fatigued, okay? So, you, and again, you can have both, and the, and the semantics can get a little tricky, but I think it's important to try to make that distinction when you're, when you're talking to patients. Um, let's see. Oh, here's one. Breakfast doesn't leave you sleepy. Why should lunch? Well, that's because of circadian rhythms. There's a natural dip in your alertness in the early afternoon. So people often blame it on lunch. And there may be some a factor from that, but the biggest factor is, is just a circadian dip that occurs then naturally, which is the source of the siesta. Okay, there's the logic behind the siesta, and it goes back to that. Um, Short-term trouble sleeping. Uh, it's it's if you're uh, if you think evolutionary-wise, if you're in danger, if you're at risk of starvation, it's going to be normal for you to have trouble sleeping. You, uh, and and so our in some cases it's normal. When it keeps going on, that's that's a, a, it becomes its own problem. And then uh, next slide. So uh, on our. I meant to show it before, but that's our, our logo for our sleep clinic. And we have this Latin motto, E Somno Victoria, which stands, which is like uh, E Pluribus Unum, out of many one, uh, from sleep victory, is what it means, okay? And so we, in the military uh, environment, uh, take this uh, uh, very seriously. Um, and I guess that's a great quote there. And uh, another one of my font, uh, great quotes is, the most effective weapon system on a warship is a well-rested crew. And next slide. And then in the end, we come back to Shakespeare. You know, the liberal arts education well, puts it back in the proper context. And uh, I think that quote from Shakespeare and Macbeth is, is, is a great one. And then I'm done. Uh, any questions? What's worse, chronically not enough sleep, or chronically too much sleep? Uh, there, there is a such a thing. One yeah, thing. yeah. There, there are studies to show you can get too much sleep, but uh, not enough, by far and away, is the bigger issue. Yeah. Yeah. 
Like, what are you telling your patients with the Phillips machines? Uh, well, where I'm at, we've always been ResMed people. Okay, okay. So, but we do have people. So there's two major CPAP machine companies, ResMed and Respironics. I compare them to Ford and Chevy, okay? We've been Ford people, ResMed. Uh, Walter Reed, you know, they're Chevy people, okay? Um, so most of our patients have been ResMed. It hasn't been an issue. We are very fortunate in that TRICARE, the uh, insurance company we work with, uh, after a little while, not too long, actually, just a couple months into the, the mess, uh, came out and said, uh, uh, and the message is that, uh, let me step back for those who don't know what's going on. So uh, Respironics uh, makes uh, CPAP machines. And their CPAP machines, uh, when used with a device to sanitize it called a SoClean, the SoClean device uses ozone. The ozone in turn damages the foam insulation in the machine. And it basically ages it. So let's say it was designed to last 20 years and with enough ozone, it's, starts acting like it's 20 when it's two. So all this stuff's breaking down and at least in theory can get into and then into your lungs. So Respironics is recalling all their machines. It's really only the machines that have worked with the SoCleans that are a problem, but they're recalling all of them, okay? So uh, anyway, uh, the other major company, ResMed, uses a different kind of foam. I think they just got lucky. You know, they just, so they don't have that problem. Anyway, so uh, TRICARE uh, made the decision that we will replace their machines with ResMed machines. And eventually the money stuff would sort out down the road, but up front, we're just replacing them. So that's what we've been doing. And I, I, I guess we're, that makes it easy for me compared to probably a lot of uh, other guys out in the community. Yeah. yeah. Is that the Sleep Force uniform? Sleep Force. Oh, oh yeah, right. Army, right. Navy, Air Force, Space Force, Sleep Force. Yeah, I understand they're gonna use, uh, they're gonna use like Air Force Army ranks, yeah. which is really tragic, don't you think? How can you go to, you know, you need to be a captain to, to lead us. Oh, yeah, that's it. And then even on our motto, which is uh, Medical Association Plan. I think we got some stuff to get to. Yeah. Laura, do you 